right, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. We will conclude a series on true freedom. And we've been talking about in this portion of it, you are what you produce. And so let's read our foundation text in Galatians chapter 5. Let's begin reading at verse 19. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Uh, you are what you produce. Verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. They're revealed. They're manifest. So this is how you know whether or not you're in the flesh or you're in the spirit. And so it manifests or reveals itself this way. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, all of those are sexual sins. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So the scripture is very clear here. We're not talking about someone that has made a mistake and is working through their process of growth. That's not who we're talking about. We're talking about someone that practices all of the areas or some or one of the areas that we just mentioned. Now that's a person that's living in the flesh or living uh, in sin. And so the scripture is clear. It's not one saved, always saved. And so if I practice these things, I will not hit inherit eternal life or the kingdom of God or eternal salvation. All ways that you could say that. But the fruit of the Spirit. Now that word but there cancels out everything that we just read up to that point. So that's not the big deal. What we're getting ready to read is the big deal. If I focus most of my time, energy, and effort on everything from here down, I mean, I won't have to worry about all the other stuff. And so it goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And we know that God is love. So the fruit of the Spirit is the character of God. It is God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and it's love that produces joy, peace, long-suffering. I mean, when I love you, I can be a little bit more patient with you. It's difficult to be patient with people that we don't love, but when I love you, I can deal with whatever it is that you're, you're going through, and I can be patient and long-suffering while you're working through your process. It's love that allows me to be long-suffering. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I mean, when I love someone, I don't want to do anything to hurt them. So love will help develop the fruit of self-control. So it says here, um, it goes on to say here, uh, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Law there is referring to condemnation. No one can bring you under condemnation when you're developed in the fruits of the Spirit. No one can judge you when you're developed in the fruits of the Spirit. And then our text for today is actually in verse 24, 25, and 26, which, are, which is our conclusion. Paul says, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires or lust and desires. So Paul is saying here, those that are truly Christ, those that are committed to Christ, they have gone through this process, which we'll talk about today, of crucifying their flesh, subduing their flesh, and bringing their flesh under. We'll talk about what that looks like today. So it's expected that after someone becomes born again, God places his spirit on the inside of us. It's expected that we go through a process of change where we no longer act the way we used to act, but we act more Christ-like. Verse 25 says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another another. So today, in conclusion, we're going to answer the question, how do we walk in the spirit instead of the flesh? You all believe that's a good question right there? How do we walk in the spirit instead of the flesh? And so Paul wouldn't give any teaching without telling us how to do it. I mean, he wouldn't give us a bunch of information and then not tell us how to be victorious in the information that he's given us, okay? And so we're going to learn today how do we walk in the spirit instead of the flesh? Paul tells us again in these final three verses, and all of our points will come out of these final three verses today. Let's read those again. Those who are Christ, verse 24 there, has, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, 
let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Point number one today is we continually must crucify our flesh daily. Key word there is daily. How I many you know I can't just crucify it on Sunday? I must crucify my flesh how often? Daily. Sunday and Thursday. Daily. How often? Daily. What's daily? daily? Now, if you know anything about your flesh, how I many know your flesh doesn't take days off? You can have a one victorious day, then you'll look up, what happened to me? It's because your flesh doesn't take days off. So if you take days off, then how many know your flesh will start to gain ground on you? And really what we're talking about here is wrong thinking, okay? So point number one today, we continually, we must continually crucify our flesh daily. The word crucify here means to subdue. It means to be brought under. One Greek word here translates it as extinguish. And so when you think about a fire, uh, I mean, you know, the way to put fire out usually is with water, right? But you can't put a massive fire out. Uh, I mean, you, know, you can't bring a, a, a water gun to a massive fire. You'll be squirting that water gun all day long. So in other words, the bigger the size of the fire, the more water I need to put on that. I mean, you know, the Word of God is a type of water, and it cleanses and it purifies. And so you have to know what areas you are on fire in, because we all have them. Don't sit there and look like you are 24 hours a day, saved, sanctified. Hello, somebody. We all have areas of our life that if we are not careful, they will overtake us. Right? All right? And so now, we must crucify our flesh daily. We must subdue it, we must bring it other, under, and we must extinguish it. What does that look like? Go with me to Luke chapter 9. What does that look like? I mean, you know, your flesh will eat everything it wants to eat all day long, won't exercise, sleep in. I mean, your flesh is just set on stupid. <laughs> if I don't on purpose and if I'm not intentional about subduing it and controlling it, all right? Now, what does that look like? Luke chapter 9, let's look at verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 says, uh, here Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him what? Let him deny himself, take up his cross. What's that next word there? Take up his cross daily and do what? So to have daily victory, then we must deny ourselves daily. But then we also must follow him daily. So it's twofold. I have to wake up with a conscious decision. Flesh, you are not running my life today. All right. Flesh, sit down. We're getting ready to spend some time in prayer. We're getting ready to get in the word of God. Hello, somebody. And then I have to be intentional about saying I will obey what I've learned today so that I can have victory today. All right? But every day I've got to go through a denial process because I wake up thinking crazy stuff every day. That's not godly. Anyone else in here thoughts go through your head every day? that God wouldn't be pleased with. No question. We all go through that, right? Because the mind is the battlefield. So Luke here says, then I've got to come after him. I've got to deny myself. I've got to take up my cross every day. And how many know everyone's cross is different? My challenges are not your challenges. Your challenges are not my challenges. So you have to know you, know what those challenges are. You have to know where the fire is burning in your life, and then on purpose and be intentional every day to extinguish that, subdue that. Come on, put that under and say, no, you will not win today. Amen. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's look at verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31. Paul here writing to the church at Corinth, notice what he says here in the 31st verse. He says, I protest by your rejoicing 
which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, look at what he says here. I die how often? He's not talking about a physical death here, is he? No, he's talking about I die to myself daily, which tells you self wants to do something contrary to the Word of God and the will of God every day. Anyone in here willing to be honest? If you come from anything in your background, you know your background tries to creep right back up on you. Right? You also recognize that you can have stretches where you've been successful and seemingly free from something for, for weeks, months, and then all of a sudden, what happened? It creeps back up on you. Well, what happened to you? You took a day off. How many know your enemy takes no days off? I'm preaching better than you all saying amen. And so all he really does is he waits on a better opportunity to come back and represent the same stuff when he knows you've spent no time in prayer, no time in the Word. Hello, somebody. You are celebrating past victories. All right, let's keep going. Let's look at it another way. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> so Paul said, I die on Sundays. <laughs> you know, that's what most people do, though, right? They do what they want to do on Saturday and Friday night, and then they come, watch this, Sunday is the Lord's day. <laughs> so I'm going to act right on Sunday. But then Monday is my day. Tuesday is my day. Wednesday is my day. I know Friday is definitely my night. <laughs> Saturday, it's on and popping. Then I go back and make myself feel better on Sunday <laughs> by honoring the Lord's day. How I many know you're not going to have much victory if you only die one day a week and feed your flesh the other six days? To have seven days of victory, I've got to deny myself seven days and spend time in prayer the Word of God seven days. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Paul says here, but I keep under my body. So he's talking about two different things here. He said, I keep under my body. How many of y'all know we're, I'm not a body? I'm a spirit that lives in a body. And I possess a soul, which is my mind, my will, and my emotions. But I am not a body. How I many know my body has to be programmed? Right? It, it does what either my spirit instructs it to do or my mind, my fleshly thinking instructs it to do. And whichever one is the strongest, how I many know the body just conforms? Right? So notice what Paul said. Paul said, I keep under my body. So Paul said, I do the things necessary to keep my body from controlling me. How does he do that? He said, I bring it into subjection. The Amplified says here, I put it through hardships. I buffet my body like a boxer. Well, you think about uh, the, what was that, Floyd Mayweather and Pacquiao. I mean, the part of their training prior to that fight was just taking a lot of body blows to condition their body for the hits that they would take during that fight. So to get ready for that, I mean, no, they had to put their body through hardships. All right? So I'm going somewhere with this. So Paul said, I bring my body under. I bring it under subjection. I, on purpose, put it through hardships. Why does he do that? He says here, the rest of that verse, so that when I preach to others, I myself should not be a hypocrite and a castaway. Isn't that good? Okay, so now let's talk about this for a moment because this looks different for every person in this room. Every person's battle, every person's struggle is different. We just all have a struggle. Okay, once again, this is the, this the real save side of the room here. Everyone's battle is different. Everyone's struggle is different. But the reality is we all have a battle and we all have a struggle. Yours might be food. Yours might be alcohol. Yours might be the opposite sex. Yours might be cigarettes. Come on, somebody. 
Yours might be hanging out with the wrong people, but we all have something. So, so Paul said, I, my spirit man, which means he must spend time every day. If he said, I die daily, he must spend time in the word of God and in prayer every day. I mean, no, that's putting your body through hardships because you don't wake up. It's time to pray. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, none of us wake up like that, right? We have to get our body up and make it go do what it doesn't want to do. We don't want to pray. We don't want to listen to the word of God. We don't, all that. You ever notice as soon as you come to church, you get sleepy. <laughs> and then as soon as you leave church, all your energy comes back. How I many of y'all know that's, that's intentional? Because your flesh, what your flesh is trying to do is keep your spirit from hearing something that will control it. People want to talk to you, distract you, keep you out of the service. All kind of stuff. Amen. And if you're not paying attention, you won't realize that's all, the enemy's behind all of that. Because he doesn't want your spirit to hear something that's getting ready to control your flesh. Isn't this good? All right, so now, what does this look like? It looks, it's different for every person. Paul said, I bring my body under. I, I put it through hardships. Now, at 22 years of age, I was Satan's, man, listen. I don't even know how to describe this. I was, man, when I, man, probably when I'd walk in the room, Satan would go. That's how bad I was prior to salvation. And so my problems were the opposite sex, uh, alcohol, and clubbing, party. Now, I know none of you all never done any of those things. I'm just telling you my situations, okay? All right, and so now, I realized this is a problem that controls me. And so, in other words, I don't want to do it, but I can't stop doing it. Even when I say I'm done with that, I still go back and do it. Somebody in here know what I'm talking about. I'm never, I'm done with the clubs. I'll meet y'all up there about, uh... come on, let's just be honest in here. And so now at 22 years of age, what's clear to me is I don't want to live my father's life over again. There has to be something better than this. Come on, somebody. I want more out of life. I don't want to treat females like this. I love and respect my mother too much. I'll have a daughter one day. Come on, I don't want somebody treating my daughter the way I'm treating other people's daughters. So I'm going through this process of, man, I got to get my life together. And it dawned on me at 22 I need to give God four years of my life undistracted. And so I'm getting ready to put my body through four years of hardship. Watch this. And what I committed to do was never miss church and not rob from God, not steal God. I committed to never miss church, give God 10% of everything that came into my hands, and I said I will not date a girl, I will not go to a club, and I will not drink alcohol for four years. It's just me and God. Now, how many of you know when you do that, your body goes through withdrawals? How many of you know I was shaking? Boy, I, I, I was like a fiend, like a cracker. Anybody here willing to understand what I'm talking about? Man, I could see a girl's toe, and I was like, oh, Jesus. Is it okay to be honest in this building? And, man, I'm going through because I'm changing from this old messed up fleshly controlled man to allowing my spirit to get on the throne and begin controlling my flesh. And it's not easy, folks. It is a daily battle. It is a daily struggle. And you must get up determined every single day that I will be victorious today. Even if you messed up yesterday, get up again today and say today will be better than yesterday. Then what, what you want to happen is that you start having more better days than you have bad days to the point where your better days just so outfire your bad days that you know you've got this thing lit. So make a long story short, I realize if I don't control this area of my life, I'm going to destroy my life and everyone I come in contact with. Right? So I do that. I put my body through hardship. I, I, I subdue it. I, I put the fire out, right? And so now here's the real test. Can I be around a female without violating her? And that's the real test now. 
So the first young lady I, I see, I don't violate her, never kissed her, didn't that, just realized we weren't a good fit, a uh, good mix for each other. Next one I meet is Patricia Elizabeth. She was Davenport at that time. And we married three and a half years later, but we married without having sex prior to marriage. Now, he, he, here's the thing. You all know the story. He, here's the thing, though. There's no way to accomplish that. This is where people are fooling themselves. If I don't make the four-year investment to control my flesh before I get married, marriage does not solve the issue of my flesh. Actually, it might expose it. And so when you talk about 18 years of marriage without cheating on your wife, listen, you won't find a female anywhere that would even tell you I flirted with her. When you talk about 18 years of that, that has nothing to do with how great my wife is. That has everything to do with how great God is and his ability to keep me before I even married her. So it, it was the original foundation of proving before God that I could do this that made it easy to prove it to my wife. Trust me, if you won't do it for God, you cannot do it for a human being on this earth. If God can't keep you, you cannot be kept. And so alcohol, it's been 26 years, wine or anything, since that's touched my lips. It's been 26 years since I violated the opposite sex, and it's been 26 years since I've been a club, in a club. But the one thing I know about my flesh, if I go in a club this Friday, I'll still know what to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, I walk right up in that club like, boy, what's up, boy? My man, boy, boy, what's up, boy? What you, what you do? I mean, uh, that's why I don't put myself in the situation for my flesh to act a fool. Right? If you know me, that's why I don't play with the opposite sex. I don't play with them. I don't play with them. You bring something to me that's, that's sketchy, I'm going to hit you real hard. Not physically. I'm just going to let you know real quick. Man, happily married man, love my wife, love my kids. Man, I, I would never do anything to just really hurt God, my wife, or my children. In that order. Quick to say that. Because I know if I start conversating, how you doing? I'm doing all right. How you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Wait, wait, wait. I mean, you're getting ready to start heading down a slippery, slippery slope that you might not be able to recover from. That's my situation. But everyone in here has a situation. And at some point, you must put your flesh through some hardships. If it's food, you're going to have to put the sweets down for, for a season. Come on, somebody. If it's procrastination, if it's laziness, you need to get up and go to the gym consistently so that you reprogram your flesh. Okay? Last story I want to share with you about this. I'm trying to give you a daily understanding, daily commitment to this. About a year and a half ago, I was in the gym, and, uh, you know, got friends with a lot of the fellows in the gym. They didn't mean any harm by this, but this young lady was obviously over on an elliptical machine, and um, they ran and grabbed me. They were like, man, come on over here. You have never seen nothing like this before in your life. I don't know what they're talking about. What they were talking about was her backside. I'll just say that. And so I, I'm, I go over there. They're like, look at that. I'm like, man, what's wrong with y'all? Man, stop. <laughs> so I go back on the other side, all right? But then the Spirit of God quickened to me because you could tell she felt bad because people were laughing at her. The Spirit of God quickened to me to go back around and encourage her. So I went back around, came back around the front. And I encouraged her, and I said, you know what, just keep doing what you're doing every single day. And you're going to look up a year from now or so, however long it takes, and you'll have the last laugh. People won't have the last laugh. I hadn't seen her for a long time. So I'm standing in the cafeteria this past Friday. I finished my workout, and I'm there. And this, late, this girl, because you don't even recognize her, this girl walks up to me, and she, says, she stands beside me. She bumps me on my arm, and she says, you see me. So I looked back around, and I said, I see you. And then, this, and then this is what she said. She said, I've got 20 more pounds to go on my goal of losing 140 pounds. <laughs> right? Right? Then she asked me, uh, she said, are you coming back tomorrow? I said, no, I'm actually finished. I do four to five days a week, so I'm done for the week. I won't be back till Monday. She said, I do seven. So if you understand, the goal that she had out in front of her requires seven days 
every single week to lose 140 pounds. She's already lost 120 with 20 to go. How I many of you know that's a blessing right there? Huh? Now, do you think she could accomplish that without a daily commitment? No. no. So, so think about that. If that's what it requires to lose 140 pounds, what's your area? At some point, you're going to have to put your body through something to accomplish anything. You want to be debt-free? Trust me. You're going to put your flesh through something, some denial. You're going to have to stop eating out. Hello, somebody. And you're going to have to say no to a whole lot of things in order to accomplish the goal of debt freedom. Amen. All right. You all get anything out of this today? All right. Point number two. Let's come on down the home stretch. Point number two. We continually live and walk in the spirit. We must continually live and walk in the spirit. Okay. Verse 25. Go with me to Romans chapter 8 and let's look at verse 1. And verse 2. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and verse 2. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and verse 2. We must continually live and walk in the Spirit. Verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. No judgment. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the what? So we're talking about the same flesh, same spirit. Same deeds of the flesh, same deeds of the spirit. Whichever one you order yourself by. He's saying if you order yourself, live in, and make it a lifestyle to live in the spirit, no one will be able to condemn you. Not even God will condemn you. He says there's therefore now no condemnation to them who walk. This is lifestyle. Order their lives. Live not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And how I many know there's no greater freedom than to, you know, for someone to do something to you and you have no reaction to it? I mean, that's a real blessing when someone is trying to hurt you, get under your skin, and you don't even react to it. I mean, that's a real freedom right there. And I can go on and on and on. You know, if you're in a marriage, I mean, in order for that marriage to last, you have to be very forgiving of each other. Any married folks in here willing to be honest? You have to be extremely forgiving of each other because you can fight all day, every day about anything, right? And you can battle all day, every day unless you get to a place where, you know what, I'm just getting ready to love regardless. And that's real maturity in a relationship. That's real uh, freedom in a relationship. Something I said in the earlier service, uh, single people, I pray that you really listen to this. See, a lot of times in a marriage, but singles never get to the marriage because they're really waiting on someone to become something before they can commit to them. When in the reality, you haven't become everything you need to be. Amen. So a lot of times we're holding people to a standard that we don't even hold our own selves to. Hello, somebody. And then in a marriage, you know, it's like there are things in this marriage and my wife and I are married for 18 years. She has wanted me to change, grow, develop, and, and get better in, and I haven't. There are things that I've wanted her to change, grow, develop, get better in, and she hasn't. Now, how I many know we could both be at a Mexican standstill and say to each other, unless you change, I'm never doing this for you ever again, blah, blah, blah. And that's immaturity. All right? And so this is what happens. People waste years of being able to have a good marriage because what they're saying is, I won't love you the way you deserve to be loved until you become this. So in other words, I'm waiting to love what I want you to be instead of what you are. Where in a marriage, you have to accept who people are. And watch this, and don't try to change them. Because the reality is, in 18 years of marriage, she hasn't changed me one day. And I haven't changed her. You know why? People don't change people. Only God can change another person. So, so true freedom says, you know what? If you never change, I'm going to love you the way that you are for the rest of my life. And then the change just becomes a bonus if that ever happens. All right? Now, I know my wife doesn't like when I don't make up the bed. I know that. And today I left the house and I didn't make it up again. <laughs> now watch this. I didn't do that on purpose. I didn't say I'm doing it. 
here's the reality. I know you want some spiritual deep answer. I, I needed to go get in prayer, and, 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 and I needed some extra time in prayer. I don't have a spiritual deep answer for you. You know why I didn't do it? I just didn't feel like doing it. <laughs> I looked at the bed, and I said, I don't feel like making it up. I mean, now, she has a choice to come in there and either take that personal or say, you know what, I know he loves me. He didn't mean that, right? And so one or two things are going to happen. It'll either be made up before I get home or when I come in, I'll make it up. And to me, that's the only deal there. We're not getting ready to make a mountain out of this and vice versa. So, so if it's that big of a deal, just make the bed up. If it's going to bother you all day not being made up, just make it up. If not, walk past it, and when I come home, I'll make it up. Now watch this, folks. That's just one. I can tell you hundreds of things we could go at each other about all day, every day. But you've got to get to a place. True freedom says, you know what? I, I just love you. And if you never change, I'm good with this for the rest of my life. The reality is she wants breakfast in bed. I've never done that in 18 years of marriage. Now, I've gone, I've called it in, I've gone and picked it up. Listen to me, AJ, I put it on our plates, got out the silverware, put it on the bed and breakfast thing, carried it all the way in. It was her favorite breakfast. She appreciated that. But I mean, no, that's not the same as me in that kitchen learning how to make that omelet. Hello, somebody. And so I feel bad about that. I need to learn how to cook. That's the bottom line. I need to learn how to cook. <laughs> but watch this. If she's going to make a decision not to love me based off of me not learning how to cook after 18 years, I mean, are we getting ready to have a frustrated, miserable marriage? Huh? Now, listen to me. I wouldn't say this if she was here. I, I promise you all, I promise you all, I will learn how to cook. I don't know when that will be, but, but before she leaves this earth, I will learn how to cook. I promise, okay? But I thank God she loves me, and I don't know how to cook. You all see where I'm going with this? And I'm just telling my side. How many of there are things I can say about her that I've been waiting on for 18 years? It's never happened. But watch this. I don't love her any less. I'm not going to not do for her and get better. Hello, somebody. You, you all see where I'm going with this? True freedom right there. When you can still be who you are, regardless of what other people do, even in your marriage. All right? Let's, well, two more verses. Romans chapter 12. How do I do that? Okay, I've got to change the way I think. The only way I can change behavior is to first change the way I think. Romans chapter 12 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your what? Reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the what? So that you may prove what is what? Good. And the perfect will of God. So notice, if I want to change my behavior, I have to change the way I think. All right? And so that's so important. Behavior will never change if I never change the way I think. And then also, I've got to make sure every time I read the word, I read it and I study it for the purpose of obeying it and doing it. Write down James chapter 1, verse 22. James chapter 1, verse 22. Musicians, you can get yourselves ready as I prepare to close. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not what? Notice what it says, deceiving your own selves. So at any point I listen with no intent to do, I mean, no, I am in deception. Right? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, The study to show yourself approved unto God. So you have to study to demonstrate. Study to show. Study to to do, study, to prove, not to people, but your personal relationship with God. And how I many you know when you do that, God's going to make sure you don't become ashamed in any area of your life. Your marriage won't bring shame. Your children won't bring shame. Your finances won't bring shame. When you study for the purpose of showing yourself in God that you want to live this and do this, how I many you know God won't let any shame come to your life in the area that you flushed out, okay? Last thing for the day, and we're done. 
Don't make it about you. Okay? Don't make it about you. Verse 26 says here, let us not become conceited. The word conceited means self-glorification. Don't make it about you. Make it about other people. Make it about serving. Don't make this about what you can get out of it. Don't study because of something you want. Study because you want to grow closer to God. I mean, when you grow closer to God, you'll get all the stuff that you want. See what he's saying here? So he says, uh, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Provoking here means calling forth to oneself, challenging and irritating. Notice why. Envying one another means to be jealous of. And so what he's saying is we need to stop picking on each other. And what I learned from this is people only pick on people that they're jealous of. So when you find yourself talking about someone and picking on someone, it's really because you're envious and jealous of that person. Right? And so we've got to stop picking on each other and start loving on each other. You know, church sometimes can be a place, man, where no one gets along. <laughs> Hello, somebody. You know, it, it can really, and it should be a place where there's so much love here and we respect each other's differences that at the end of the day, I got my own issues. So I'm not getting ready to put you in a prison over your issues. And we're just getting ready to love each other. We're all growing. We're all in our process. And so Linked Up Church, I want to develop a culture here where we don't pick on each other. Wouldn't that be a blessing right there? Somebody falls, let's just go pick them up. Let's not pick on them. All right? You think we can do that, Linked Up Church? And always keep this at the back of your head. You only talk about people that you're jealous of. And you only pick on people that you're jealous of. So when you constantly find yourself talking about one person, always bringing out what they do wrong, always talking about their shortcomings, it's because you're envious and you're jealous of them. I'll never forget a time I was in a meeting with a person, multiple degrees, very educated person, and uh, he kept picking with me about something. And at the end of the day, I, I just asked a simple question. With all of your education, then why am I outperforming you in life? It was just a simple question. Because how many know education doesn't mean you have wisdom? Especially if all you can see is what's wrong with everybody else. Something is warped about that when, when my education causes me to look down on other people. What my education should cause me to do is serve other people. And if I truly love them, I would say I'm strong in that area, so let me cover them and make them look good instead of exposing them and trying to show everyone what they can't do so I can look good. You see what he's talking about here? Which means I've got to go all the way back into the fruits of the Spirit and grow so I stop treating people like that. This good stuff, isn't it? Did you all get anything out of this today? I'm done for the day. I'm done right there. I'm done. I'm finished for the day. Come on. Isn't God good? Huh? And so, to have a successful team, here's the reality. I can do stuff that Minister Vinny can't do. He can never be me. I don't care how much he tries. He can only be the best Minister Vinny that he can be. But watch this. He can do stuff that I can't do. I don't care how I try. I can never be as good as him in certain areas. Now, I have a choice. I can either look down on him because he can't do what I can do, or I can embrace what he can do, which is what I can't do, and the two of us can get together and look how much better we are together instead of judging each other about what we're not good at. And so I will have a team someday. Now, now I'm in mode. Trust me, I'm, I'm engaged in this church. And I'm setting my faith for a team that only sees things that way. So that, that comes together and understands that the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Right? And the moment I begin to see judging and putting people down and lifting yourself up, I can't have that around me because we won't accomplish much. Right? Order for a team. I can't get upset, Javon, 6'9". I, mean, I don't need to be down there rebounding. We play ball on Monday nights. I can't get upset with him because he's 6'9". No, go get the ball, big fella. <laughs> right? And if we're going to have success, then he needs to get it and outlet it to me. And let me dribble. 
right? But you always see the big fella. He want to dribble, and the little guy want to be down. No, play your role, right? And then if I'm smart, because he rebound, I should reward him on the other end, right? Because that's going to motivate him to rebound more. You all see that? And so I don't need to be 6'9 when I have someone 6'9 on my team. So even in a marriage, there, my wife, she's stronger than me in a lot of areas. <laughs> It'd be foolish for her to look down on me because of the area she's stronger than me in. The reality is she still needs me. And watch this. I'm stronger than her in a lot of areas. It'd be foolish for me to look down on her. But watch this. It's interesting how God put two people together that Can we do that? Watch this. I've seen that kind of behavior destroy whole churches, spending all their time talking about people, Amen. trying to figure out what's wrong instead of coming together to figure out what's right. Amen. All right? Y'all get anything out of this today? Amen. I'm done. I'm done. Now, what do we want to do here? Bow your heads, close your eyes. Search your heart today not tomorrow today search your heart today right where you see just begin to search your heart and determine within yourself where are you